Hi, I'm Hannah Lau, and I'm a lecturer in university studies at Colgate University. Welcome to Peopling the Past. What topic are you talking about today? I'm going to talk to you about zooarchaeology. So zooarchaeology is the study of animal remains recovered from archaeological contexts. So animal remains refers to things like animal bones and teeth, um, which are probably the most common things we find, also shells, uh, but it may also include other types of animal skeletal elements. Um, in rare cases, we may find hair, uh, even the exoskeletons of insects, though that's really quite rare. Um, so often they look like little fragments of bone, so like what you see here on this table on the left. And from looking at them and thinking about their shape, uh, we can infer uh, that in the past, there were animals like this goat and the sheep that were um, interacting with the people who created this site uh, and somehow ended up as part of the archaeological record of the site. And thinking about how is really part of our big, major question for us. So I'm going to talk to you about this in the context of um, one particular site, the site of Kizkla, which is located in the uh, Nakhchivan Autonomous Republic of Azerbaijan. And the site was inhabited um, from the Middle Bronze to Early Iron Ages, which at this site means from about 2000 to about 900 BCE. So one thing that's really cool about this site is that it actually lets us look at two different ways um, animal remains entered the archaeological record. So we look at them in the context of the settlement um, and where we're primarily looking at people's trash, so the remains of what they ate on a day-to-day -day basis, things like that. Um, and we can also look at them in the context of kurgans, which are these monumental burials um, where animal remains were often included either as food offerings or occasionally as sacrifices. All right, what sources of data do you look at? Well, I look at a lot of animal remains. And so, as I said, this, for me, this primarily means animal bones and teeth. And they can tell us um, so many things about the past. They can tell us what people were eating. They can tell us how people spent their time and their energy. So if you think about how long uh, you may spend a day planning your meals, things like that. Um, and for us, we often, right, we can go and buy ingredients. We're not raising it from the start. Uh, raising food or finding food, it takes a lot of time. Uh, they can also tell us what ancient environments were like and how people engaged with them. And they can tell us whether and how people incorporated animals into their ritual practices. So, how can this topic or material tell us about real people in the past? So, what I'm going to talk to you about today are animal remains that, are, um, that enter the archaeological record by deliberate human choices about what to include. So um, animal remains from the site of Kiskala, as I said, they let us look at what people were consuming on a day-to-day -day basis, but also what animals seemed like suitable companions to send with the dead into the afterlife. So the site, um, so the settlement parts of the site are shown on this aerial image uh, in rectangles, and the burials are shown sort of on these upper low hills um, in circles. So the site was excavated by the Nakhchivan Archaeological Project, which is, which is a joint American-Azerbaijani project. Uh, and let's look first at the animals that were recovered from the settlement. So what this slide is showing you is a table and a chart, um, which are telling you about all the animal remains um, that I could identify to a particular species that we found at the site. So unfortunately, this does not reflect all the animal bones that were recovered from the site during excavation, just the ones that were in an complete enough that they could be identified to having come from a particular species. So uh, you see them here um, broken into two groups. So there's the Middle Bronze Age group and the Late Bronze Age to Early Iron Age group. And what this is showing is um, sort of what we think were two different periods of activities at the site. So things like building, things like this. Uh, and so this lets us look at change over time by sort of breaking it into these two groups. Um, and these two groups are broken into ways that we actually think that people in the past sort of like reflects their activities. Um, but when we look at them together, we see that there's actually a lot of similar similarity in what people ate over time. So uh, the largest section of both the Middle Bronze and Late Bronze to Early Iron Age um, collections are sheep and goat and then sheep and goat. So what is the sheep goat thing that you see here? It's not some animal that doesn't exist anymore. Unfortunately, sheep and goat look really similar in terms of their skeletons, so we can't um, necessarily always tell them apart. It depends what animal bones we find. So for particular parts of the skeleton, we may be able to say, okay, this was a sheep, okay, this was a goat, but sometimes they just have to go into this big sheep-goat category. Uh, where we can tell, sheep are way more common than goat, 
Um, the next largest group we find are cattle. So this is another domestic animal um, that they would have raised. Uh, we see um, for the Middle Bronze Age and a little bit for the Late Bronze, Early Iron Age, something from this group called equids, which refers to um, the, the larger group of animals that includes horses, donkeys, um, asses, mules. Um, and unfortunately, their skeletons are also quite similar, uh, but probably those animals were also used for things like transportation and labor. And we also see um, in a small portion of wild animals, things like red deer, wild goat, gazelle, um, that suggests that the people at the site, uh, while they primarily were engaged in raising their animals for food, also occasionally hunted in, say, the nearby forests near the river or in the sort of steppe area on the low foothills near the site. All right, let's look in detail at one particular group of animals, so this largest group of sheep, goat, and sheep. So what this slide is showing you um, are the are sort of different animal bones that were found, or excuse me, it's showing you what goat and sheep bones uh, on the top and then sheep bones alone we found from the site, uh, whether they came fused or unfused. Okay, so what does that mean? So um, for all animals, including ourselves, we are after all animals, uh, when we are quite young, when we are juveniles, uh, our, and we haven't finished growing, parts of our bones are not fused to other parts. So I'm pointing right now to my humerus. And the top part of it, the epiphysis up here and the epiphysis down here at the bottom, uh, would not have been fused to the shaft of the bone. Um, and this would allow me to grow, but as I reached maturity, um, my, when I reached sort of the size I was gonna become as an adult, uh, they fused together. So this is true of a bunch of the different bones in the body. And for each species, uh, these happen in sort of a predictable order and at predictable times. So what does this have to do with the graph we see here? What this is showing you is, a uh, bones that were found from each of these particular categories that were found either fused or unfused. So if the bone is found fused, we know that the animal lived beyond the point at which this bone would have been fused. So we know that, for example, uh, for the proximal radius, uh, so this category A, we know that any radius found in that period seems to have been fused, which means all of those animals live beyond this zero to six month category. Okay, so this lets us kind of get a larger sense of what age people were choosing to kill their livestock. All right, so why do we care about this? Um, this lets us also get a sense of what maybe some of the things that they were getting from their animals was. And this is because animals produce both primary products and secondary products. Okay, so a primary product um, are things that you get when the animal dies. This includes meat and viscera, things that you can eat but also maybe bones and hide, which can be used for craft production or um, for clothing or other kinds of uses of leather. Um, and then secondary products include things like wool and dairy. So um, things that, like milk, butter, cheese, yogurt. So that's something you can eat. Wool for textiles and also dung, which is an important fuel source. Um, when we look at this graph here, we see that a certain portion of the population um, for both sheep and goat when looked at together and for sheep alone, uh, is being slaughtered somewhere between like a small or some portion is being slaughtered sort of prior to 18 months of age, um, and then it's significantly more between 30 and 48 months of age. And this is around the time when um, these animals reach sort of their largest size relative to the amount of food you put into them. So you're, you're growing them, you're growing them, you're growing them, and then they're sort of just maintaining their weight. So you might be choose to take out a certain section of your animal population at that point um, because it would sort of let you get the most meat, so the most bang for your buck, if you want to think about it that way. But some large portion of the um, animals are also living beyond this period, beyond the point where their bones tell us about their age because they've become um, adults and so they're fully fused together. And so it suggests that they're probably also using these animals for things like secondary products, so like wool and dairy, um, and also maybe dung fuel. Uh, so they're getting sort of both of these things. This is reflecting two different kinds of choices that the people are making. So now let's look at animal remains in the context of these burial contexts that we talked about. So kurgans are these monumental burials. Um, they usually have some sort of uh, large earthen or stone cap on top of the burial chamber. Um, and some of these would have been quite visible on landscapes. And this is significant, especially in this area where uh, we envision that people were moving around quite a bit. So here on the left, you see uh, an illustration of one of the kurgans that we excavated uh, by Selin Nugent, who's the bioarchaeologist who also studied the skeletons. 
um, and you can see some of the types of burial goods that accompanied these skeletons on the right, which include um, a lot of ceramics. They may also include things like weapons, like um, arrowheads, uh, different kinds of personal adornments, so beads, pins, things like this, but also animals. So let's look at some of the animals from these kurgans. Um, so of the 10 kurgans that we excavated, four of them had animal remains. Um, and for the most part, the most common types of animal remains are the same animals that we saw showing up most frequently um, in the settlement trash. So what this is showing you here is not the number of bones. We found way more than one or sheep goat bone, for example, in kurgan CR2, uh, but rather the minimum number of animals uh, that would need to die to account for the bones that we found in the settlement, or sorry, excuse me, in the kurgan. So uh, what is significant about this? Um, it's showing us that it seems like the animals that were the important companions for people in life, so the animals that they spent all this time with, the cattle, the sheep, and the goat that they were raising, were also uh, the important animals to attend to them in the afterlife. There's one sort of interesting exception, which is CR3, one of the Kurgans, uh, and this had uh, also some bird remains, and uh, there were probably the partial remains of at least two hares, um, and also significantly a canid. So uh, we think this was probably a domestic dog. And so as you may recall from the settlement data, it doesn't seem like people were eating dogs, but you can imagine that a dog, which who is a great companion, maybe also really helpful in herding animals, might also seem like a good companion to take to the afterlife. So we're seeing a real resonance there um, in the significance of the animals that accompany people into the afterlife as the ones they spent their entire life with um, during their time on earth. So the sort of, these life cycles are really closely tied together. Okay, so in order to understand the animal remains in even better detail, it's really important to combine them with other types of archeological data. So here on the right, you see um, examples of ancient seeds that were recovered from Kizkla and analyzed by Lucas Proctor, who's a paleoethnobotanist. Paleoethnobotanists um, look at all the plant remains that are recovered from archeological sites. So plant remains tell us a ton of things about people in the past and their engagements with their environments, you know, what they were farming, what they were gathering, um, what the environment was like. But in this particular case, uh, we're interested in them because of what they tell us about the animals. And that's because Lucas thinks that quite a lot of the um, plant remains that arrived at Kizkla arrived there as part of dung fuel. So as you may recall, I mentioned that um, People in the past burn dung for a variety of reasons. Sometimes it's because of how available wood is, and other times it might be because of cultural or social ideas about what an appropriate fuel source is for a particular activity. What's really great for us as archaeologists, and particularly zooarchaeologists, is it tells us what animals were eating. So from Lucas's analysis, he found that uh, they were eating quite a lot of wild and weedy taxa that we might expect to find in the environs around the site. Um, but they were also eating some agricultural products, so things like barley and wheat, and also millet, which was a new cultage in there. And this is really helpful because it lets us think about the kinds of decisions that people were making. They could choose to um, feed their animals agricultural products. They can choose to take them to pastures either pretty nearby the site, maybe they could walk there within a day, but maybe also at certain times, especially during the really hot summers where uh, the plain gets really warm and the mountains stay cool and the grass stays greener, maybe they took them farther afield. Uh, so these are all kinds of choices that they're making in the context of a whole economic system that's happening around them too. So they're choosing what plants to farm, which require a lot of labor as well. They're thinking about okay, if we all go, what happens to these plants? Maybe some of us go, maybe some of us go for a short time, maybe some of us go for a long time. These, all these kinds of decisions are being made together, so it's one integrated system. And by looking at animal remains and plant remains together along with all the other types of archeological data, we get a sense of how the system worked holistically and what individual people's choices were during this time. Uh, so archaeology, it's a lot like a team sport, right? We all have different positions that we play, uh, but when we work together, we get sort of even better results. So thank you so much for watching. Uh, please check out all the other great resources on the Peopling the Past website, and videos, and the blogs, podcasts, things like that. Uh, so thank you so much.